I grew up in a secular household in southern New Jersey. My mother is Jewish, but only culturally so. As such, her children grew up Jewish, but only culturally so. We did not attend a synagogue, nor did we have much Jewish community around us. In towns nearby, there were Jewish communities, but we were not part of them. Outside of the home, I was often reminded I was an outlier, told I was not Jewish enough, that I had not done things the correct way, that I was not a part of the community. In my adulthood, I've learned that my mother's experiences were just the same. This is an investigation into what it means to be a representative of a culture, whether there is or is not a correct way to hold one's own history. Our focal point is an endangered language, Yiddish, which began and nearly ended as a language of the Ashkenazi Jewish people. Today it is being revived, and as such, we must ask ourselves what place it has in the world moving forward. Together we will discuss who has the right to possess a language. This is an investigation of my own history through the lens of an interview with my mother, Stevie. Raising her children, Stevie seasoned enough Yiddish into her English in the home that I grew up seasoning my English just the same. With no formal understanding of the language or its history, I simply assumed our Jewishness and our Yiddishness were synonymous, both fragmented connectors to a greater community of which we were not directly affiliated. I assumed that other Jewish households contained within their walls the same outpouring of Yiddishisms as mine, and so its significance went undetected for decades. In autumn of 2021, I began studying Yiddish and its history more formally, learning the Hebrew letters and the way the language has come to be used as an act of community building, solidarity, and resistance. I learned that Yiddish is a language of migration, reflecting a transitory people. It is not a language representing a state, and so it exerts no force other than that of the community that wields it. I learned that Yiddish played a role in anti-Zionist movements and anti-capitalist critiques in the 19th and 20th centuries, and from there my interest was piqued. Yiddish no longer felt synonymous with a passive connection to my ancestry. I felt political and ideological ties to those who have harnessed the language. From then on, my mother and I would speak more consistently about the language, and I taught her some of what I was learning. Over the last year, I began to notice a shift in her. She might say a word in Yiddish, and then pause and ask if we both understood it to mean the same thing anymore. Of course the words meant the same thing to me, as our conversational peppering of Yiddish into English, our Yinglish, was completely divorced in my mind from my more scholarly learnings, and I could hold in my mind a separation between familial and historical etymologies. I found myself pondering this duality, and in particular, I found myself observing my mother, noticing how, as we discuss the language more and more openly, she finds more and more stories to share from her childhood that incorporate usage of the language or expression of the culture. It seems that in my attempts to reclaim a connection to our heritage, my mother has become more comfortable reclaiming it as well. This project seeks to more deeply interrogate that heritage. Stevie's connection to the Yiddish language in conjunction with her connection to Judaism and Jewish culture and how those connections commingle. This investigation seeks to shine light on the question, who owns a language? The origins of Yiddish go back about a millennium, with early Jewish residents of Germanic-speaking areas combining Hebrew and Aramaic, the languages of the temple, with German of the time. Specifics are debated, but it is generally agreed that Yiddish started as a dialect of Old High German and evolved over time into its own language. From there, the migration pattern of Ashkenazi Jews is woven into the fabric of the language. As these Yiddish-speaking Jews were forced east, they incorporated the linguistic traits of the areas they traversed. By the 20th century, Yiddish was a language comprised of Germanic, Semitic, and Slavic syntax and loanwords. By the 1930s, it is estimated that there were nearly 11 million Yiddish speakers worldwide. In the northeast cities of the U.S., there were multiple journals and newspapers in Yiddish. By the end of the 1940s, however, the language was almost completely lost. Currently, there are approximately 3 million speakers worldwide. My mother's family left their home in Odessa, Ukraine at some point around the turn of the 20th century and made a new migration, one common among Ashkenazi Jews at that time. They came to America. 
They landed first somewhere on the east coast of Canada and then came to Philadelphia, where Stevie's grandmother, Yetta, was born. Stevie's mother and Stevie herself were also born in Philadelphia. My mother recalls that Yetta and her husband, Meyer, would speak in Yiddish as a way to communicate with one another without the family understanding. Stevie's acquisition of the Yiddish language was indirect, what is considered implicit language learning. She inherited knowledge of the language naturally, as family around her spoke it in the home. Against all odds, she absorbed enough Yiddish to call it her own, enough Yiddish to pass down to her children. Yeah, might have been. In that regard, should it be more aimed to me? No, you're fine. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. okay, cool. So, can you tell me your name, your place of residence, and your relationship to the interviewer? Stephanie Wolos. I live in Galloway, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And I'm your mom. That's right. Stephanie? Stevie. Yeah. <laughs> you want to do it again? If you want. Okay. Uh, yeah, you want to? Yeah. Okay, go for it. Um, okay, can you tell me your name, your place of residence, and your relationship to the interviewer? I'm Stevie Wolos. I live in Galloway, New Jersey, and I'm your mama. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, oh, Stevie, not Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been really funny. Can you tell me a little bit about your relationship to Yiddish? That's a really, uh, can you be a little more specific? Well, I'm, I'm asking I, questions, I think, in, in a funnel way. So I'm okay. going to start general. I, I'll give you... My give relationship you, to Yiddish. To your relationship to Yiddish, and then my follow-up, or maybe more precise, would be like a first memory of the language. Oh. Or a first, mm-hmm. you know, a first memory. It doesn't have to be the first memory. Well, I grew up in a house mm-hmm. with my grandmother, um, predominantly... My grandmother and grandfather, my mother, um, and then my grandmother, mostly my grandmother and grandfather's extended family were in and out all of the time. I mean, they didn't live there, but they Mm -hmm. were in and out all the time. And um, they both were Jewish. They both spoke Yiddish as well as English. Mm -hmm. Um, Yiddish was the kind of secret language amongst the adults whenever there was something that they didn't want the children to know about. Right. Um, Adults being predominantly those two grandparents, right? Mostly Yetta. Mm-hmm. Um, Meyer, my grandfather, Mike, was hardly ever around. Mm-hmm. Um, he worked two and sometimes three jobs. He was a baker. and um, But they would have, like, uh, like bridge night with, uh, like, friends, which always were family. Wow. They would pull out a card table. Kids would go to bed. And they would speak in Yiddish? Off and on. Oh, But okay. if they knew that I was sitting on the stairs and I was watching, uh-huh. they would break into Yiddish, certainly. I mean, Yiddish was, the, like I said, the private language, the language of, adults. of adults. yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. So, so Yetta and then Yetta's friends air quotes but you're you're saying that's family. they're always they're all family i mean when i think about it i don't i can't think of i i think there was one um couple mm-hmm. who were not physically related and they were around all of the time they were close to i think my grand i think they first were with my grandfather but basically they were like you know my grandmother and grandfather were were a unit Mm -hmm. and um it was jaime 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 and i don't remember jaime's wife's name i'll get it but uh they were friends from long like friends Mm -hmm. for a long time um, what I recall about Jaime, um, in terms of the family dynamic, was that Jaime had loaned my grandmother and grandfather money. Mm-hmm. So that gave him a seat at the table. Like that oh, was interesting. like, yeah. Yeah. It's funny being so many steps away from this, you know, other than infancy meeting Yetta, um, never, or never meeting Yetta. I think that 
you forget that people can have friends, right? Like you said, you said Yetta would have bridge night with her friends, right? And that didn't even cross my mind when you talk when you in the past have talked about Yetta speaking Yiddish. I just thought, oh, Yetta and Meyer spoke Yiddish to each other, but. I have questions on this list that we can all, actually it was fairly all s- extended family that spoke <laughs> Yiddish um, at a lot, and you know Yetta would be present. I, you know, I can vaguely remember her speaking. She certainly spoke Yiddish. Um, she would speak it. You know, uh, she would call a name. Mm-hmm. You know, she would say like, "Ugh." Altakaka, mm-hmm. you know, like you yeah, know, yeah. she would. It would be a derogatory thing, yeah. or she might say "bubala" yeah. or "shayna madela" like mm-hmm. that. But um, you know, sweetly. Um, but it wasn't like she was. It wasn't like that was her primary language, yes. and that she was having to translate to get mm-hmm. to English. Um, and the. I have a feeling that was probably the first time that I even said "friends." Because it just would have been family. Mm-hmm. It was just um, probably Meyer's family. Like mm-hmm. he had a whole bunch of sisters and brothers. Right. So, I guess an extension of that. What were their Meyer and Yetta, and maybe also these people, these extended people? What were what were your family's relationships to Judaism then? Hmm. Um. So I was raised, <laughs> I'm going to give you two different, an- like a couple of different answers, I think, because I was raised in a household, like I said, with my grandmother, who was really functionally a difficult woman. Mm-hmm. And throughout m- most of my life with her, was sort, she was sort of seen by others as childish, childlike. Mm. Like she wasn't. She didn't run the roost. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so she was an odd woman. I was always told, you know, um, we're Jewish. It wasn't like they sat me down and introduced me to Judaism. I just had an understanding that we were Jewish. And I had an understanding that my family was from Russia, and mm-hmm. they said Russia. Right. And I even found, uh, kind of recently on um, on Ancestry, I found, like, uh, census mm-hmm. data that's only available to the 1950s, mm-hmm. which is a shame. But I found census data that showed, you know, um, family members under one roof, not mine, but, like, not my own having been born, but, mm-hmm. you know, Yetta's family or Meyer's family, family members who, for whom some of them were listed as having been born in Russia mm-hmm. and then others, the babies were born in the United States. So they all came from what I was told was Russia. Right. It was Odessa. Yes, right. I believe. Or somewhere around Odessa. Though my grandfather um, was came to the United States from Canada. Right. But I believe their family also came from Russia. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, or know that they did. So my understanding about Judaism, um, we didn't practice any kind of um, ritual, religious rituals, um, the, Any the nuclear ho- family, mm-hmm. like the group of us, which would have been my grandmother and grandfather. Um, I'm sort of uh, exiting out my mother and father. So my grandmother sure. and grandfather and then their families, their immediate families. I don't think they went, none of them, like outside of my family mm-hmm. even, went to synagogue um, we just were Jew- Jewish because we were Jewish. Right. Did you do the... Holidays, you asked. Did you do holidays in the most uh, essential way? Did you, like, have a meal? Or did you the even... The foods, yeah. Cook? Holidays Holidays were understood. Um, was it some of them? Was it, like, you know... Was it, like... There was, Pesach? you know, Rosh Hashanah uh-huh. and Yom Kippur and Hanukkah. Mm-hmm. Those were, like, the really big ones. Okay. There were candles lit. Um, yurt site candles yeah, yurt lit sites, yeah. for family, family members. members on the day of their death. Yeah, yeah, 
did you? So that was actually going to be a question. Did you do Morris Cottage? Did you do recitations of anything? It was happening. They, they, in, somebody did. Yeah, it was happening in the household. Right. And if I asked yeah. a question, I was told what it was. But right. nobody ever. But somebody was doing it. Around yeah, you. it was happening. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, cool. And the holidays were not. Nobody was reading. We weren't okay. having seders sure. in the, in the, uh, in a religious way. Yeah, yeah. We were having meals. Yeah. For a holiday. Okay. Yeah, that, I, it's so interesting how pervasive Kaddish is. Just as a tangent off of any of these questions that I have, this is not written down. Mm. Just how. Um, yeah, how uh, that's the word I think of. How pervasive Kaddish is as a communal practice rather than a ritual practice, rather than a, you know, religious part line. And it's it's such a powerful it's thing. Really powerful. And I don't recall, I, prob- I, I probably heard Kaddish, like, um, I'm trying to remember when my grandfather died, I was 14. Mm-hmm. And um, I know that he was buried in a Jewish cemetery. Um, that was a blur time for me personally anyway, so I don't really remember a whole lot about the, um, like, services, but my feeling was that they probably did go to a synagogue. Mm. I feel like, and if they didn't go to a synagogue, um, he was buried in a Jewish cemetery, there w- probably was a rabbi who did Kaddish. And this is who, Meyer? Graveside Meyer, mm-hmm. when he died. Um, he died forever. He yeah. died for four years, he was mm. dying. Um, so I feel like I had, I, I had some familiarity with the sound of Kaddish. Yeah. Um, so that years later when I went to synagogue and I was sitting in a synagogue and they began Kaddish, Mm -hmm. I just wept. Yeah. It was just, I felt like I was hearing you know, just the sound of um, something that was like constitutionally familiar. Yeah, definitely. So. Cool. Yeah. Um, how about uh, how about foods? Yiddish or the Ashkenazic foods growing up? So there was a lot of food that they ate. I mean, if you walked into my house, you'd have no doubt that we were Jewish. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you looked in the refrigerator, you'd have no doubt that we were Jewish. Um, that doesn't mean that I ate it. Mm-hmm. That was going to be a Gefilte question. Did you have a favorite or was least favorite? <laughs> so sickening to me. I could not understand the <laughs> jelly yeah. of you know gefilte fish. My grandmother was not like a you know a major chef, so. Um, was she the one preparing most of those things, though? Well, I mean, it was her house. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, I mean, food was, it was grandma's food. It was chicken soup and kinedalach, which is mm-hmm. the matzo balls, and, um, you know, kugel, and, yeah. which my grandmother called kegel. Uh-huh. Um, you know, it's funny, the dialectically, that some of the vowels, Yiddish is such a widespread language. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the vowels are just, they just change. Mm-hmm. It's a really good, I'm getting ahead of myself <laughs> in terms of other questions and whatnot, but um, it's Yiddish is such a good practice in maintaining a sense of descriptivism rather than prescriptivism. There is not, you know, just being like, no, yeah, there's not really a right way to do it. it sounds like somebody else uses a different le- vowel sound there. That's, right. that's cool. Right, right. <laughs> Kickle. Google, okay. I struggled with that. I uh-huh. struggled because I didn't um I, I didn't grow up in a very like you know, um nobody was explaining Yiddish to me. Mm-hmm. I had to pick up the meaning on my own. Um and I understood it in context. Yeah. So that, you know, when I was very young, if somebody said like what does that mean? I couldn't necessarily say right. what something meant, but I could tell you generally like what it meant. Yeah. Um, but because I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, my grandmother's, um, relationship to Judaism, she wore like a, like armor 
Mm. I have no doubt she had reasons. Sure. But because she was a complicated woman, um, the only time you ever heard her say, you know, like, I'm Jewish, Mm -hmm. was because somebody treated her in a way that she didn't like. They didn't, Mm. the butcher didn't, you know, respond to her request or... You know, somebody didn't let her sit at the table at bingo night. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they do that because I'm Jewish. Mm-hmm. It was always, you know, blah, 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 because I'm Jewish. Yeah. So she wore that like a, you know, she was persecuted. Yeah. Um, which some of which, uh, in terms of stories I know from, from your childhood, in some of those areas that you were growing up in northeast Philadelphia is valid, right? Like, you experienced the same Abs- thing as a small child. Absolutely. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but... Yeah, yeah. I'll talk about anything you want. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, sure. I mean, there it was a very kind of um, Irish, mostly Irish Catholic, mm-hmm. and then Jewish, largely Irish Catholic mm-hmm. in the area, but also Jewish... I think that pretty much the, those were your options. Buy a house. Yeah. <laughs> You're either going to St. Tim's, mm-hmm. which was around the corner. Um, there was a synagogue um, nearby, but I didn't learn about that synagogue until I was like... I was still a little kid, probably six or seven, but my sister, who was uh, just about two years older than me, um, mm-hmm. had a best friend, and they were observant Jews... Mm-hmm. Um, and so she went, they went to synagogue, she was bat mitzvah, you know, she went to Hebrew school, like that. So a lot of the, a lot of the language, like learning the alphabet, you Mm -hmm. know, that kind of thing, like the more formalized stuff I got from Robin, Mm -hmm. was her name, my sister's friend. And this was in Northeast Philadelphia? Yep. Right. Um, so Yetta's house was existed where it existed right. from the time that I was born, mm-hmm. and my mother, uh, and and sometimes father, uh, just moved in and out of Grandma's. Right. We moved around a lot, so Grandma's house really was that was home, mm-hmm. um, and we we never really went far. Right, but I think my my question was or my leading <laughs> was to that. That interaction, that 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 space being um, predominantly Irish with some Irish Catholic, with some Jews also there. You've talked about in your own childhood having some <laughs> bad run-ins with yeah the, run-ins, I had <laughs> with run-ins the Irish with the Catholics, I had run-ins then, with the Catholics, and then maybe Yiddish or maybe Yetta also did. Maybe in, in maybe she ways. maybe she had maybe, yeah. I, don't know. I mean, I'm not gonna absolutely. I mean, she went to probably. most of the places that had bingo, which yeah. she was addicted to. Um, oh, yeah, you talked about going with her, right? You talked about Yeah, but her. she went to bingo pretty much every single night, and they were always at, it was going to be at a church right. or Knights of Columbus mm-hmm. or blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. I had no idea what these places were because it was just, like, in the basement, you know, yeah. in a room. But, um, yeah, bingo. So, surely, the people that were at bingo were any number of a mix of people, mm-hmm. um, Anyway, so okay, so um, I I am I am at fault for not staying on on task. Actually, um, <laughs> the, that question started with talking about foods, mm. and you named some of the foods. Did you have a favorite? Um, I love Kugel. Dish? Yeah, love that. I'm, I tend about what Kugel is? I tend toward yeah. So it's a noodle casserole. Mm-hmm. The Very way creamy. my grandmother made it, uh, not creamy at all. So really? um, egg noodles. Mm-hmm. Um, it's sweet so on the like slightly. Hmm? I thought it was like cottage cheese in it. Cottage cheese, sour cream, mm-hmm. yeah. sugar. That's why I meant cream. That's why I meant that. Yeah, but it's not. It doesn't when you you bake it. Yeah. And then you let it cool. Yeah. Eat or you eat it cold. Um. You don't have to eat it cold. You can eat it warm, but you want to let it set. Um. It just ha- it's on the slightly sweeter side. It's mm-hmm. not like you would eat it with beef. Did you put cinnamon on it? I didn't. They, sh- they she did. They did. Yeah. yeah. Sour cream. Right. Sour cream. <laughs> Goes on everything. On 
everything. Yeah, of course. You just bathe in sour yeah. cream. So blueberries and sour cream mm-hmm. and strawberries sugar. and sour mm-hmm. cream, bananas and sour cream. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And those are so some of those are your. Bo- if favorite. she had borscht. Yeah. Sour cream. Did she make um, beef borscht or uh, meat borscht? She usually made a beef. A beef. A beef borscht. borscht. Yeah. Um, and um, she also made a beef barley soup, mm-hmm. which I really loved a lot. Yeah, barley because it's furry. I know, yeah. You know, so foods that were like soft and furry. Were... I used to make something like that in my childhood, right? Oh, God, yeah. Mm-hmm. All the time. Yeah, yeah. I miss that. that. I'm yeah. The barley. Yeah. Anyway, but um, my favorite foods. Yeah. Um, I loved her chicken soup. I loved matzo balls with my whole heart. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think about... Oh, and then pastries. My grandfather was a baker. Right. For, um, like, for... Uh, what do you call that? Like, major bakeries, mm-hmm. you know? Gold medal mm-hmm. bakery in Philadelphia. Uh, and there was another one. It was... Meyerwitz or so, you know, yeah. some company like that. And um, so he would come home, you know, at like five in the morning and there would be like hot bread in bags mm-hmm. yeah. on the table because then they would like ship them. They would place them in trucks and ship them off and he'd be done with that job. He'd sleep for a couple hours. He'd go out to the next job. So bagels and mm-hmm. um, I liked... Um, Rye bread, but only toasted, really hard, like yeah. almost like swipeback, mm-hmm. with cream cheese. Yeah. And Kaiser rolls mm-hmm. with cream cheese. <laughs> yeah, cream cheese and sour It's cream. all about the cream cheese and <laughs> sour yeah, cream. Yeah. Um, so I have a question here that you, you've sort of answered already, and I'm just, I'm going to ask it anyway in case we, I can rack your brain anymore. Um, I'll ask it as I wrote it. Did your family have any connections to any other Jews? were you part of any larger Jewish communities in the area? So you're talking about these family friend family slash friends of Yeah, Meta. they were they were family. Right, right, I mean right. they were definitely family. There was no uh she didn't have any kind of like um I don't really recall like close friends. Yeah. She was a pretty bitter lady. Mm-hmm. I don't really recall like super duper close friends um everybody was family yeah so she was you know close to aunt T- she was close to tilly which was meyer's sister mm-hmm. i have to try to remember who she was married to um but i'm fairly certain that tilly was blood related not and mm-hmm. not married to um, so it was all family. It was yeah. just all. It was just all family. But then you named this this girl Robin. Who is Robin was my sister's. sister's friend. My sister's friend was Robin, and, and my and her family was Jewish, and they were like, they were kind of unavailable to me because my sister. It was my right. sister's friend. Right. So if I was lucky, I got to be in the house and play Barbies in the basement. You mm-hmm. know and. Um, smell the foods that they were making from wherever they were from. Like, yeah. her grandmother made um, pickled cucumbers. Mm-hmm. Which I remember later thinking, like, how is that not a pickle? But it wasn't. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It was, like, kind of like a sweet and sour thing. Um, and fresh. Snappy. I didn't... I wasn't a big fan, but I liked that that existed. Um, and Robin... Like I said, kind of taught me some things, and I found my way to um, Beth Israel, no, Temple Shalom, mm-hmm. which was not far. Like that probably was the big mm-hmm. synagogue nearby. Um, it was sort of a hassle to get to because I was a little kid, and it was like there were like big highways and stuff. Nobody gave like nobody was saying like. Oh, Stevie's out crossing the boulevard, you know, like six lanes in either direction. (laughs) But um, I 
discovered that they would have, that they did, like, um, blanken on. I would get apples. Jesus, what's... Passover, Pesach. Pa Pesach. I was going to yeah. say Pesach, and I was like, no, nah, that's mm -hmm. not it. Um, and Sukkoth, like that. Like, so there would be, like, um, apples and apples and honey, but there was also, like, there's that kid taking our apples from the... They would have, like, a big basket of apples outside the door of the Actually, synagogue. The, no, you're right. The um, honey, and, honey and apples is Rosh Hashanah. It's the High Holy Days. Right. But... You had to pay. Like, yeah. I yeah. didn't. I don't know that I ever entered the doors. Oh, interesting. It became. It was like not for me. Yeah, yeah. And I think that set in motion the idea that, um, as much as I had heard, again, it was always like in the ether. It was never somebody sitting me down and telling me these things, but I understood that there was this concept of birthright, you know, like mm. you are Jewish or your mother's Jewish, then you're Jewish, right, like sure. that kind of thing. And at the same time, I was kind of like a poor Jew because yeah. I didn't, I somehow had learned that because I didn't start any kind of formal you know, Hebrew school right. or learning or connection to synagogue, I was way behind the eight ball. There was never any way to get that, uh, to own it. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling conflicted because I understood the, um, the importance of just experiencing the culture and how that really w was not connected necessarily in yeah. religious practice. But it still got muddled in my head. Yeah. That concept of, of ownership, you know, is, it's, it's, it's really messed up. Like, who gets to... Who Be a Jew, to, yeah. Who gets, who gets to possess that? Who gets to be part of the community? Right. Who gets to possess the language? Mm -hmm. Who gets to possess the food? Right. You know? Uh, I mean, I had no like, trouble with the food. The idea of the mat matrilineal kind of heritage is, is, is fascinating until, for about three seconds, until it's immediately weaponized against people. Completely. It right? was, That's yeah. all it ever is. It's only yeah, ever just, weaponized. It was, yanked, it was yanked out from under me so yeah. that I, um, as I got older, I mean, I can remember feeling really angry with my grandmother because she would do the whole, like, they don't like me because I'm Jewish. Mm -hmm. sure. You know, having, she had this dining room and it had, like, a whole wall of mirrors, you know, mm -hmm. like mirror tiles on the wall. and That's where we would have you know, um, meals, uh, holiday meals, family, big family meals. And, um, she was fetching about something. She was just really mad and stop foot stomping kind of mad. And, um, talking about, you know, how she's, she's not accepted because she's Jewish. And I remember saying to her, like, what does that even mean? Mm, yeah. Because I ended up to almost like, I, I almost, I, I feel ashamed now, but it was like, I ended up taking the position of the persecutor. Like, oh, well, you're calling yourself Jewish, but like, do you even know? Like, what's, right. what is Passover? Mm. Like, what does that even mean to you? Like, what is that? What is that? As yeah. though I was like quizzing her not even as though I was like yeah. quizzing her like what right to you do you have to like pound your chest and and scream about being Jewish when like do you even know what that is mm. you know yeah which is shitty yeah. but but there was also this sort of message in the household like I mean where else would I have gotten that yeah, I was right. only going to like elementary school, you know, and then home. Like, yeah, that was yeah. my whole freaking life. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I ended up sort of, like, 
swallowing that attitude, at least in that moment of my life. Like, it was right. kind of fleeting, but in that moment of my life. Movie recording has been stopped automatically. Why? Just don't do that. I swear I didn't touch it. No, I don't believe you did. Um, well, that's okay. There will just have to be a moment of... <laughs> uh, Pause while I drink yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. A moment of, like, technical difficulties. I don't know why I did that. Um, is it recording again? Yeah, it is. I just hit record. Sometimes it will break it into multiple files. Is there ti- yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, is it on a timer of any kind? Maybe? No, I don't think so. Um, at what point were you, you said, you know, like Yiddish was not for you, even in the house, right? Uh, It was the language of the adults. At what Mm -hmm. point do you remember peppering your English with Yiddish, what I'm, what I'm calling Yinglish, right? Yeah. Um, I think by the time I was probably like... I'm going to guess, because a lot is a blur, but I'm going to guess that it, I probably was around 10 or so, mm-hmm. that it was understood, that I probably understood a lot mm-hmm. more than they would like to have had me know. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, what they were doing is just bitching about the stuff they were yeah, yeah, about yeah. in English, but somehow... You know, maybe Aunt Dora didn't want to be saying that stuff or sounding that way in front of, you know, if if there were children nearby. So, um, because that was usually, if there was like a string of Yiddish, a conversation in Yiddish, it would have been like if there was family visiting. My mother, I honestly don't know what she knew. Mm-hmm. I don't, she was present and not present and, right um not engaged right. in that way but um Yetta Yetta would speak it with other adults mm-hmm. or even with um her grown son so she had three children who were all 10 years apart right, right. so her oldest was Bob mm-hmm. and then Elaine, my mother, was born 10 years later, and then Ellen, mm-hmm. and... So Bob spoke Yiddish. I think, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure that Bob had conversations with her. I feel like wow, I can yeah. put Bob there. Wow. But, I mean, Yetta was probably t- early 20s when she had Bob. Mm-hmm. And my mother was born in, let's say, 1945-ish. Mm-hmm. So... You know, he was born in what, 35 ish? Yeah, yeah. Completely different world. Yeah, a world actually with a lot more Yiddish in it. Right. In the 30s, there were. Right. And they bought, the of- they bought the house that I grew up in, I think not long after, like, my sister was born. I think by the time I was in that house, like, born. Mm hmm. Um, I think they were already in that house. I don't think they ever, my grandparents ever lived anywhere else in my memory. Well, so. I, I'm thinking about um, that negotiation that happens when you're a kid and you hear adults curse and you want to figure out, there's different ages where you want to figure out what curses you can do. Mm. Like, well, maybe they wouldn't want me to say damn, but I can say dang, you know? Or maybe they don't want me to say hell, but I can say heck. Or maybe they don't want me to say shit, but I can say hell, you know? And I'm thinking about that and wondering whether or not, like, um, once you st- once you started incorporating Yiddish, was it, like, if it originally wasn't a language for you as the adults to catch, <laughs> um, do you feel that they... How do you think they they saw a little kid using Yiddish? How do you think, if, if, if Yetta, if you could freeze frame Yetta and look inside her mind, how mm. do you think somebody like that was saw her granddaughter um, incorporating Yiddish into her language? Honestly, sadly, I don't think that she thought one way or another about anything. Yeah. Like, she was living really... Like, she was just surviving every day. Yeah. So I don't think she thought much about the 
kind of the handing down of, Mm -hmm. um, like, the importance of the handing down so much. I I mean, that's uh, that's not fair, because I think she was... she was a very selfish child. I have, in some ways, a lot of understanding about how she got to that place. But, you know, as a little kid, like, you're not thinking, how did my grandmother end up the way she is? All I knew was, um, I was a bud. Mm. She was going to, you know, um, the deli to go get a cup of coffee and a sandwich. Did I want to come along? Yeah. Because I was company. Right. And I was entertainment. So was she thinking I shouldn't say that? I mean, she was very childlike. Yeah. Um, I think she it probably gave her great joy when I said, you know, get cock enough and yum. Mm -hmm. Go shit in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that that probably tickled the shit out of her. I mean, yeah. she, that probably made her really happy. I, I don't know how old I was when I learned that one. And I probably was taught it, and I can't really even remember who would have taught that to me, but... Yeah. I was taught that, so... That makes sense. I yeah. That. Over the years, we're going to work towards work towards present now. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, do you feel that... I do want to say one thing. Yes, please. In terms of Judaism and mm-hmm. and being Jewish, being, you know, hearing and speaking Yiddish, mm-hmm. um, my, my grandfather's brother um, Uncle Manny mm-hmm. Manuel his first wife died. I didn't know her. So remember, this is my grandfather's brother. It's not mm-hmm. my it's not my father's brother. So you know they were older, but um, he had two little girls who were about my age, and he married a woman who was not Jewish, mm-hmm. and she converted for him, which was seen. There was like a. They, like, held her on high. Hmm. Like, that was really something that Aunt Anne Mm -hmm. um, and Uncle Manny, um, she converted for him. She adopted his children. Um, She was really kind. Her, one of her daughters, I believe that in that household, and especially probably because she converted, she was, like, much more... Um, I didn't have a lot of contact with them, um, but she was much more observant, mm-hmm. and certainly at least one of her daughters grew up and became very observant, married a man, ended up being very con- like conservative Judaism, right, like right. separate plates for things, right. and that was like an animal we didn't understand at all. So right, that was also right. a source of like, what is that I remember that, that like, some of those elders like Yetta would say, or I guess like, Yetta and Maya what is that craziness, that. Mm-hmm. right? Even though like Avi was Rebecca mm-hmm. and Avi. Uh, Birdie, she went by Birdie and Avi. She this was the daughter? Birdie was the daughter so and you're... Birdie married Avi, so she would have been my first cousin once removed. Something like that, yeah. Um... Anyway, that was like an unusual sort of a thing. Because the rest of the family were just sort of like, we were just being, I don't know what, we were mutts. There was like, that was that, that attitude. Mm, there was sort of like almost pride and like, you know, we are just mutts. You're right, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that that's, that's kind of, I'm thinking about the 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 impact of, of America. I think that's in, in many ways part of the American um, the American uh, migration that happens is that you kind of get to retain some aspects but you ask to drop other parts very often and so you do end up maybe elevating one aspect, being saying, Oh, you know, quote, I'm a mutt 
you know, mm. or, and there's facets of what you do get to elevate. Oh, I'm Jewish in this way, but then often you don't need to retain other aspects of that culture, or you're even often asked to drop aspects of that culture because that's not what you are anymore, you know, things like that. Like, there's sort of a superficiality a lot of times in, in migration stories for people who come and then want to have something, they have something, they have a connection, but there's like a superficiality to it. No. Yeah, and I think I think that for like seeing through the eyes, which I could, I only had the option of seeing the world through the eyes of like my grandmother, mm-hmm. right? Even though as I got, I mean, I was pretty young when I started to sort of catch on to like, mm, yeah, I think grandma's got a grandma skews things uh-huh. <laughs> in a direction. Yeah, yeah. But seeing through the eyes of my grandmother, anybody that was um, observant. It was, what's the deal? Like, what's the shtick? What's, why would you go through that trouble? Interesting. Right. Um, So it wasn't even so much like, why can't you be more like us? But why Mm. would she do that? Like, it just never in a million years occurred to her. Yeah. Why anybody would do the things that they do. Yeah. You know, be, be observant or, you know, find meaning. Right. And yeah. <laughs> why would ritual? anybody find meaning? <laughs> why would you find meaning? Yeah. And then I would say, like, you're lighting candles. Yeah, right, light, right, like, right. You know, but that was just habit. Sure. Anyway. So, yeah, so in your in your own personal life then, this, I think that's a good transition as we move forward in time. It's less about them and more about you. So do you feel that... Your connection to to Yiddish, even just pepperings of Yiddish into your Eng- into your English. Do you find that that over time that's ebbed or flowed? Have you had periods where that has been more prominent, been less prominent? It's hard to know because my gut wants to say that as I've gotten older, it's become more prominent. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I'm not so sure that that's true. Maybe you've just become more. I think I'm more observant. I mm-hmm. think I'm more aware because right. I'm then getting it through the eyes of other people. Like right. you said to me recently, that somebody outside of the family mm-hmm. at that time observed that I s- spoke a lot of Yiddish. Yeah. And that surprised me. Right. Because I'm just talking. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So. I have a feeling I probably always have done that. Mm-hmm. My verb and is pepper. I find that like <laughs> season your English or pepper your English with Yiddish, right? Mm-hmm. And create the a meal schmutz. that is yes, <laughs> <laughs> a smear of Yinglish. Um, now or maybe throughout your adulthood, um, how do you feel when you hear other Yiddish other adults use Yiddish words or phrases? Mm. If I hear another Jew speaking across a room, you Uh, know, in a market... Throw um, throw a word out there. I I can hear... I feel like I can hear it like a bell. It's just like... (laughs) My people. Like, Mm -hmm. there is such a um, a really strong... I I can feel that really strong pull. Mm Mm-hmm. Of familiarity, mm-hmm. so it's not even so much that I need to go and talk to them. Though I do feel there is this. Oh God, how do I say that? Because like I, I live in an area. This particular little area. That is, I don't think, really terribly Jewish. Mm-hmm. There are there population. are population pockets nearby, but right miles. Yeah, yeah, but not you in know, the immediate. Mm-hmm. Like let's. You know, stunk us down and, mm-hmm. um, you know, in Margate. Mm-hmm. Cool. Right. Outside of Margate, you know, yeah. not not so much. But my point is, so if I'm walking through the supermarket here in Galloway and I hear somebody say something, or I, if I was teaching a class and a student said something and used a Yiddish word, mm-hmm. and, you know, you can tell... If it's a person using a Yiddish word, I can tell. Mm-hmm. If it's a person using a Yiddish word with great familiarity, f- literally and figuratively, familiarity. Yeah. Um, 
and if I, I have had occasion to hear a Yiddish word, depending on the, um, the, like the town, you know, you walk through New York. I mean, if you're from New York, you're Jewish, whether you like it or not. Like, you're just, <laughs> like, if you're literally from New York City, uh-huh. doesn't make a difference what your family is. <laughs> yeah. And so you have a card that sure, says, sure. I'm allowed, uh-huh. I'm allowed to use the language that I, I you know, in my town, that is the language that's mm-hmm. spoken, mm-hmm. Um, regardless of whatever the, you know, religious or, 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 or cultural, you know, heritage. But, um, Outside of that, like I can always, uh, like the word chachka. Yes, I, we, I think we about talked this. about that. There's a, you know, chachka is a thing. Mm-hmm. It's a little. Sometimes it's a pretty little thing. Mm-hmm. Like you put up your little yeah. chachkas. Mm-hmm. And I remember as a teen, hearing a non-Jewish person mm-hmm. say, "Chachkis." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it just, and it wasn't like. There was no, like, intellectual, he doesn't have a right to use that. Sure, sure, yeah. there, none of that happened. It yeah. just literally was fingernails on a blackboard. And in reality, like you said, depending on where you're from, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to, you might pronounce kugel, kugel, or kiggle. Or kiggle yeah. So tchotchke, okay. Um, but, I mean, then I heard a, a woman from Alabama mm-hmm. who is Jewish. Mm-hmm. Um I think she said tchotchke. Like, mm-hmm. okay, that's yeah, a word. Yeah, yeah. Who I, am I, I? I, as much as I can get on my high horse, like I've had that same issue. I, I very much understand that. Uh, but I have that same thing when I hear a word pronounced in a way that I'm not familiar. Yeah. And it doesn't make a difference what language it is. Mm-hmm. It, it's not so. Um. That that's always bothered me words used incorrectly. Yeah. It, just, it was like the one that was like my, um, you know, words have, pa- words, are we off? We paused again. Oh. Card full. Well, I guess we're audio I'm only. I'm talking too no, much now. No, that's okay. I, I wondered if that would happen. Like, we're audio only. That's fine. Okay. And you don't have a backup? No, that's okay. That's totally okay. No, I don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now we're now we're a podcast. Okay, good. <laughs> we're just audio. Um, good. Well, so words. So I, I I think that it doesn't. I think that if there's if there is any pause in me at all, it doesn't bother me. As a matter of fact, it is such a dying language. Right. That if we can keep it going, we can keep it going. Yes. Right? Yes. And at a point in my life when I felt like I didn't have a right. Right. To be Jewish, like I didn't have a valid card. Yeah. Like, who gave? Who gives those cards, right? But I didn't feel like I had a valid card, and I was using Yiddish, or I was peppering, mm-hmm. you know, um, what I understood. Um, then who am I to say that somebody who doesn't have a mother who's Jewish? Right. Right. Yeah, I, you know, throughout this entire thing, you've um, you've almost without fail answered a question questions before they show up, and that's exactly something oh. that I, I um, that I've been think that I was thinking about and wanted to talk about. So we can just jump right to that, which is exactly that that question of ownership, and in a, in in a case of a language that is um, endangered. Mm. Let people let people speak the language, right? Like, and right. and and it it begs the question, you know, who who owns who owns a language, and in a right. and with a language like this, and it's a language with a history based in the so many languages are connected to a state. So many languages are connected to and tools for state for statehood for the creation of something bigger than the person that can then in, uh, enforce rules or law onto a person. And Yiddish doesn't 
really have that. The op- yeah, it was like the opposite of that. It was like right. this little secret. Like my grandmother and, you know, her, the rest right. of the family used it. It was like the little secret language of in inclusion, like yeah. identifying each other in the same way you hear stories about, you know, Christians drawing a fish sure. on the, you know, on the sand with their foot. Yeah. I find it really interesting when you think about languages, you think about them, whether you like it or not, you think about them often in relation to a state or to the rules that they help to put forward. Mm. And they're either, it's either that a language does that, that it reinforces a set of rules, morals, some sort of paradigm, or it's a language that has been beaten down and is trying to find stake, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, trying to say, no, I deserve this region, or us, we people deserve this land, and to call ourselves this thing, and to use this language this that is tied to our culture. Mm. And it, Yiddish is, is such an interesting example over the, you know, millennium of, of migrations. That, it's landless. That it is truly a landless language, mm-hmm. and, and really, like, must be so. <laughs> right. I think that maybe is the only rule. Like it must be so to to maintain that integrity of of that of that the history, legitimate right? yeah the legitimacy of the history and the meaning yeah because otherwise then it 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 if if it lets down its guard it gets swallowed up right. by the state oh it's Yiddish mm-hmm. is that Hebrew right. Then are you a Zionist? Sure. Like then there's the law of return. Like it's not yeah. about the yeah. religion. Yeah. It's it's about the people. It's yeah. about a people. And and I think that I And food. And food. It's always about <laughs> food. Yeah. yeah. Um and I think that's why I, I I wanted to ask, how does it feel when you hear other adults use the language and does it depend on the speaker? Because I, I struggle with that and, and I think about that so much. Um, this if if there's cultural tie to if this language is tied to a culture and the culture is tied to a religion and these things as part of a Venn diagram are all mm-hmm. um, are all something that that depending on where you kind of fall on the spectrum you can in, you're allowed to invite someone into or you're allowed to invite someone into and they have to do a song and dance to get in, but 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 they can be invited, right? Um, but generally there's an invitation process <laughs> as opposed to just like anybody saying like, oh, I want to be this and now I am this. Mm-hmm. There's usually an invitation and that, that is, that maybe that is powerful for like cultural, in- for cultural integrity. And, and, and then in that way, I think about, well then, Yes, of course. Wouldn't I want to share this with everybody? Isn't doesn't shouldn't shouldn't a language like this get to belong to anybody who wants to learn about it? And and that is how I feel. And then I well, am there's that. so much there's so much judgment, right? Mm. So it's you know, um, it's the language of peasants. Sure. It's yeah. not you know any kind of high. It's not high. Uh, Hi, holy. It's not, you know, moneyed. Yeah. It's not moneyed language. Yeah. Um, I remember thinking, like, oh, well, you know, the Hebrew is the moneyed hmm. language. Yiddish is the peasant language. If I hear somebody speaking Yiddish, I feel hungry. Yeah. And I, I am not, I, I, I can feel my heart pull, mm-hmm. like, that literal sort of like draw to a person if I hear a Yiddish word or a Yiddish phrase at a distance. But I, it also makes me hungry yeah. for that connection. So there isn't, in general, I don't have a sense of like, who the hell do you think you yeah, are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's really more just like that pull. And then I want to know everything. Like, where do you, where, you know, where do you live? Where do you go? Yeah. But there's almost this like... Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> and it's it's not that I feel like I have to be secret in order to keep it from anybody else who's going to hear. Right. It, but there is it feels sort of fragile like or this, precious or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's still a sense of inadequacy. Like, okay, so do I go over there? In which case, how do I show my bona fides? Right, right. They're not gonna like. Are they really gonna ask me? Yeah. 
but I, I think that I still have that leftover. Yeah. Right. And we were talking about that the other day, that it, it's sort of what we were just saying about sort of looking outward. You can look, you can take that same logic, like looking outward to somebody else and say, they, they can own this language too. Mm. And you can kind of do a reflexive process and look at yourself and say, I don't have to sh- show anything yeah. or pass a test. I get to say that I possess this. And and this has been conversations you and I have had yeah. for a little while now that as much as it struck y- you, it's it struck me. And and maybe that's that's where it started. I think that I started talking about it because it 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 was never part of the narrative. But but y- you started talking more about um, that history with Yiddish and Yiddish speakers in the house mm. only, only fairly recently in a more comprehensive way. And it struck me really hard that you, know, you grew up in a bilingual household. Mm. That that wasn't that wasn't a narrative mm. that I was ever told because it's not it, never it doesn't sound like the me, way right. that you ever thought of it. No. And yet that's true. And you know what we can call um, you know the way that you inherited that language. You can call that one of the ways you can call that is that your heritage speaker. I right. say that this is it's the process of implicit language learning. Mm. So you didn't sit down in front of a chalkboard and right. get taught you know vocabulary or or syntax, but you learned certain things, you know? Right. And like you said, you didn't learn uh, the Hebrew letters, right? But, right. But, you, but that doesn't mean that you don't have knowledge right. and that you are not a speaker of the language. You right. possess the language. So, and it's just a really powerful thing to, like, to realize. I think that I never thought about until, you, like, you just said it here, um, the idea that, you know, that I could consider myself bilingual or that I grew up in a bilingual household. And right. I did. You of did. course I did. And there, that was surprising. Like, you just surprised me. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and the idea that I have a right to, like, that those, that that, that is my right to speak sure. that language or to own it or to to know it um, imperfectly because mm-hmm. the judgment's always there. Right, right. Um, internal judgment. It's all me. Um, that I, I still have a right to say, like, yeah, that's, that is a language that, I'm, I am familiar with that I under that I can understand, that I can um, ferret out. If somebody speaks a string of something, I can sort of pull bits and pieces in the same way that I can um, extrapolate the meaning of a word. If somebody, if I'm reading or or more reading than listening to, because who speaks Latin, mm-hmm. but I can pull the meaning of a word that I'm unfamiliar with based on you know my understanding of Latin. But um, yeah, I spent. Um, it's it's funny. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how this ties to what you said, but you said something that just reminded me that I um, spent years, and I'm not joking, years trying to understand um, what. Uh, my grandmother used to say a thing mm-hmm. if we sneezed, and I could not find a human alive yeah. that could tell me what that meant. Right, right, right. But I also was reaching to strange places because I was reaching to, like, um, I mean, I remember calling synagogues. I remember calling <laughs> colleges where they taught, right, right. Uh, like, Hebrew. Mm-hmm. I Nobody understood. Um, I, I would meet a Jew... I'd be like, do you understand any Yiddish? Do you speak any Yiddish? Um, And, you know, if you move in the circles of, like, say, Margate, Mm -hmm. very often um, you're not finding people who speak Yiddish. Mm -hmm. You're finding people who speak Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Um, So not understanding that I would ask people, you know, what does Vox and Susten, Leiden, Susten, Gesetzes design mean? And they, you know, they'd be like... no clue. Yeah. And it was only in the last th- 
three years that I, I could break it down before that. And I understood that that's what it meant. I could remember that my grandmother had said what she thought that it meant. Mm -hmm. Because, again, my grandmother spoke a language, but she couldn't thoroughly, like, translate. Right. Um, She just understood how she was using it. Um, So it was only recently that I was able to find a place that somebody had written down exactly that phrase... And then I felt like the world made more sense. Like somehow I'd remembered something wrong. I'd gotten it wrong. Mm -hmm. Nobody could validate it for me. And it wasn't like I had some jewel. It was more like I had this little pile of shit and I would say it, Mm -hmm. you know, when we sneezed (laughs) (laughs) because it's habit. Yeah. Um, But uh, it, it gave me such... Um, a sense of uh, joy and relief to see it. That some other Jew somewhere bothered to put that on. It was like Bobby Graham or some, right, you know, one of those right. websites, yeah. you know, to write that down. And I was like, I think I texted you. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Yeah. It's real. Yeah, that was only a couple months ago, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I remember, again, to write it down and then to send that to you. Yeah. It was like, yeah. It wasn't that long ago. So... Yeah, it's a complicated thing, and it's there's a lot of layers to the to the weight of it all, to the mm-hmm. gravity of it all. Mm-hmm. And you said like it's my right to 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 know it or my right to speak it, and I think another way of saying that is like it is literally your history, mm. and and we can say yeah, it's my history or it's oh, it's their history, but when we when we include a, the concept of Growing up in a bilingual household is right, literally your right. history, you know. Yeah. So, how do you feel as a parent when you hear your children incorporate Yiddish into their language? It's the same question I asked. So about yeah, Yiddish, I know, I know, I know. Do it yourself. So I think it yeah. Um, it would it always has made me happy. Mm-hmm. That makes me happy. I can remember um, when Sophie wanted a Star of David mm-hmm. necklace, and I, I got it for her. And I, I felt like a, a poser, and mm-hmm. at the same time, but because that was, I was getting much better at understanding the knee jerk. Um, judgment that I got from the family just regarding, like, just me in general. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But also just the family's sort of, like, um, defensiveness about being Jewish, Mm -hmm. Um, making an assumption that other people would judge it. Um, So I knew that, but I I did that for her anyway because that's what she wanted. Right. And... Um, there, I had a lot of complicated feelings about that, but I didn't have complicated feelings about putting a mezuzah on my door. Right. Um, in the language, it, that speaking, hearing a Yiddish word, mm-hmm. no problem. Great joy. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't framing that, expecting anything other than joy. I was just <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, good. <laughs> how, it, how, how it felt, you know. Just really happy. I mean, I can yeah. hear. I if if there's a newness to it, mm-hmm. I it I can hear it. Mm-hmm. And then once you know you're doing it for a while, then I might not notice it as much because then we're just talking. If you're around and you say something, you know, you use a Yiddish phrase. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I might not notice. Um, in the same way that I would notice if, if there's, if it's new. Right. Right. But, um, I mean, when you started to really in earnest, um, learn Yiddish, I just felt like I could not believe how wonderful that was. I couldn't believe, um, there were, there was so much, there was so much cause it was like, oh my God, thank God. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank God, because I, you know, somebody's got to learn, sure, yeah. and I'm really <laughs> shitty, and I know what a, you know, what a, uh, just a natural sort of scholar you are. Like you want to learn, hmm. um, you take great joy in learning, and you're going to really learn the shit out of something. Uh-huh. Um, start to, <laughs> yeah, or try to. Um, no, but that, I mean, that just made me so happy. But I feel like. I could just as easily say to you, like, you know, when did you start to really sort of live in the skin of being a person who is Jewish? Um, mm. I feel like I can, I could answer that for you, and I'm not gonna, mm-hmm. but I, I definitely can p- put a finger on when that started to, externally started to look like something that you were comfortable owning. Yeah. Or I, stating. I think it, I think it's ebbed and flowed for me mm-hmm. in my life. Um, and maybe I've worn it kind of in the yetta ish way, mm. right? In, the, in right. Sort of, some right. sort of loose way. Not really knowing what that meant or how it felt. And, and very much also, uh, un- unfortunately, for both of us, very much in line with your history you just talked right. about. A lot of the same, you know, you're not this enough, you're not that enough. Right. You don't do it. Who are you? Why do you get to do you really get to say that you're Jewish because of X, Y, or Z? And I think that those voices really get, they get under your skin. And, um, so I think I have ebbed and flowed. I think there's been periods where I've really not felt that at all. Mm -hmm. And I think in the last couple of years, um, specifically, once we got into the pandemic, mm. uh, I know that um, Claire wanted. Claire's been monumental in helping to be a an out an outside eye, mm. looking at us and saying, "Yeah, this is true." Yeah. You know, it's Stevie. <laughs> owns Yiddish, yeah, right? Yeah, And you are Jewish, which is right. a very definitive yeah. thing. Yeah, isn't that funny? Yeah, and um, <laughs> and that's that's been really powerful, and, and she's also been on top of, like, you know, how much do you want to possess that? Mm. How much do you want to inquire further about that? Do, would you like to go to synagogue? Would you like to do this? Would you like to learn this together? Mm. Um and we, I think it was before the pandemic even, we started doing Hanukkah, actually, like, actually, because maybe sometimes a couple years before that, we might light candles, but not every night, and we didn't really give right. gifts, and I've always felt unconnected to the, really, the concept of gifts on Hanukkah, because I always felt a little wary that it was maybe just, a, like, a forced appropriation yeah. by, you know, consumerists, Christ, uh, uh, Christmas-ish right. culture. Oh yeah, you get, oh yeah, you get one day, I get eight. Right. Days, and, right? and and you know, whatever. Yeah. Um and just the proximity of the winter yeah. festivals. But but there is like there I think there was a reclaiming there and, and that that was maybe my first foray into it. So it would have been sometime after twenty eighteen. My first foray got t- dipping my toe in the water of like, I can own this, I can say it's mine and I can do it the way I'd like to. Mm. Um Maybe even a couple of years before that, we like tried to, but just really steadily getting in the in the shallow end of the pool, maybe. Yeah. And then when the pandemic came, we Claire and I had a conversation about, like, and we had lots of con- the whole family had lots of conversations about the passage of time. Mm-hmm. Um, for context, we were living together, Claire and me and you and Sophie. Full disclosure. Yeah, and. Um, and just talking about the passing of time and really wanting to find all of the different tools we could use to to understand the passing of time in a, in a moment where time could so easily slip away mm. from us, where seasons could so easily slip away from us. Because you're talking about the passage of time, but really you're talking about the emotionality of yeah. that time. Yeah, and especially in something like this, which is then, you know, ritual and, right. um, and practice where you, you know, like... Oh, okay. The Jews it's know how to mourn. Mourn and gather. And, right. and and in moments where you can't gather, like, this knowledge of, okay, it's it's Pesach. Like, 
I'm here with my family. We can make a little meal. We can sit around the table. That's the only essential thing ever. But I can know that it's springtime, Mm -hmm. one. And two, I can know that other people are doing this. Mm -hmm. And I somehow feel more connected. Right. And that's really the most comprehensive religious or spiritual experience is that community is knowing like, okay, it's, it's Hanukkah, you know, and to me, Hanukkah is, is a perfect, it's a perfect celebration in the way that I, I like to do it. The essential thing, again, it's always food, but even (laughs) if you skip food, the essential thing is you got eight different times. You can have people, you can be together with people for as long as a candle will, will be lit. That's it. And you can turn the lights off and you can sit in the peaceful, warm light of that candle and you can get a little bit pensive and you can talk a little bit quieter to each other. Right. And you can just share this this slow moment. This one moment. Yeah. And I think that... So I think it was things like that progressively that that made me kind of realize how I could celebrate ritual in that way because I've always been really fascinated in ritual and story and right. how I relate to those things and there I think there were so there's so much baggage just like we've talked about this whole time there's so much baggage around that for me that it took me a long time to get to a point right. uh, where I could maybe break through that well I um, think the horrible gift of the pandemic was exactly that that yeah. like we you know every person was forced to be still right. and in a place and um, you know I've know I knew people that were handling the pandemic you know in a very different way but um, it was an opportunity to su- to feel what we were feeling and explore what we were each of us were um, needing to explore Mm -hmm. and that um, I think something that beautiful that happened there was that in the midst of being you know I could say forced but really I mean you guys you had boxes packed ready to go wherever Uh, obviously you could have done that Mm. Um, I'm really glad that you didn't so here we were this pod that had shared Values in the regard of caring for one another, keeping each other safe and caring for one another, and also had shared, um, overarching shared values in terms of um, our own space and um, contemplation Mm -hmm. and a willingness to um, begin to explore ritual because we were forced to have to stand still long enough. I mean... My, you know, pulling out um, the menorah, I mean, we had that for a very long time, Mm -hmm. but um, really pulling out in a more meaningful way didn't happen until I separated. Yeah. Um, And... Yeah, that's honestly, like, not even being funny, that's an entire other conversation that is a deep interrogation of this exact same conversation is... Is but but, it, but it's out. It's an hours long conversation. Which yeah, is, no. Which is how does <laughs> you know how, how how do you navigate in a space when you are with a partner who is not that right, who's not Jewish, who maybe right. doesn't want to experience that, you know, who doesn't want that to f- flourish in that way, right? And that's a complicated thing. Mm-hmm. That's my little tangent. Right, right. But that's the, but but the point is that when I thought of that when you asked the question about speaking. Using Yiddish words, mm-hmm. peppering language, um, you know, how far back can I remember doing that? Or when, you know, was there a point at which that sort of flourished? And I, mm-hmm. I mean, I definitely used it at work. Like, I used it out in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, I used it some in the house. I can, I feel like I can certainly say that um, once that split happened, mm-hmm. you know, I was free to explore differently. Um <clears throat> I don't know if I used the language more, but I mean, I have no idea. Yeah. I, I've not been keeping a <laughs> <Tally>. log, <laughs> <laughs> little notches on my bedpost. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
So I, I have no more questions. What? Um, but I have a little bit of an afterword, and it okay. does relate to all of this. It actually relates to exactly what you were just talking about in terms of um, like that ownership and and the and the heritage and all of that. Mm-hmm. So, um, I I want to share a poem that I wrote. Uh, when I was living in Philadelphia last year, mm. uh, as I as I wrote it here in, in, on my laptop in front of me, I say, I'd like to share a poem I wrote last year when I was living in Philly around the time that I had started really rigorously learning Yiddish. I was thinking a lot about heritage and family and tradition, and I haven't shared this one with you. Is it okay if I share it? Yes, please. Okay. It's called Our Names. In the rain in the autumn, when a new life has taken root in the husk of ancestry, I spend my days reading letters scrawled on brick left behind by my mother's dreaming. The ginkgos of Philadelphia were planted with high hopes, higher fruit, heavy on limb, rotting in place, attracting cider-hungry, binging insects, paid up front to covet seeds across state lines to lantern-lit crop circles fertile with patience. In the inane moments taken hold in innocuous towers, the maiden hair unfurls, and I refuse to leave this place the same. And I refuse to leave this place the same. The ginkgos of Philadelphia, a solitary order, refute consolidation, deemed a mistake by the city, a mistake by their own greed. My mother's shade in the heat of misplaced anger, a mistake felled in memory, thunder as each berry lands. In the leaves brushed aside, nope. (laughs) In the leaves brushed beside the curbs exploding out from gutters, I see moths stretched wide and eyes unblinking, and the river as it meets the sea. And I and my mother humming softly, tracing cracks in the sidewalk, ants to their burrows, blades of grass to the embrace of earth. Their roots wound and wound again in the dirt beneath the ginkgos of Philadelphia. In migrations to come, in the dreamless nights, under soundless skies, I am my, he- my mother, heavy on limb. Mm. It snapped a photo of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it and then oh. I have started translating it into Yiddish, oh. <laughs> which is why I wanted to share it with you. Um, and I mm. think that it's uh it's it's perfect for this for this conversation because i'm not fluent in yiddish i don't know what i'm doing right mm. but what better place to do that than to in start. poetry <laughs> like, <laughs> who cares you know and yeah. and and who gets to say no you use the accusative, but it should have yeah. been the nominative, right? Yeah. Like, so, yeah, so the first stanza so far I have translated in a way that I'm sure I'll have to fix. <laughs> but it sounds good. Because it's about the guilt and the shame. And, and, and not only does it sound good, but it, it, it feels really powerful in a way, just like when I learn something new in Yiddish, I think, oh, good. You know, I'm, I'm. I am. My arm that that bear, that holds the torch is getting mm. a little stronger, you know. Yeah. But doing something that's my own just feels like rather than listening to the conversation, I get to add to the conversation. Wow. So, I'll read to you um, the first stanza, and I'll Please. read it. I'll read it in Yiddish, each line in Yiddish, and then in English. So okay. So can see how far that I've gotten. Okay. Okay. Unsere <clears throat> Namen, our names. In der Regen, in der Ocean, as a Naya Leben hot verwurzelt, in der Umfrach, feld von Aftstam. In the rain, in the autumn, when a new life has taken root in the husk of ancestry. Ich von Manteg, Leinen, Ossius hot, geschrigen, Auf Ziegel, links hinter Durch, man Mamas Chlumus. 
I spend my days reading letters scrawled on brick left behind by my mother's dreaming. <laughs> Die Ginkgos in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> Die Ginkgos in Philadelphia sind in Gewein gepflanzt mit Heuch Hafenungen. The ginkgos of Philadelphia were planted with high hopes. Hecher frucht wichtig auf glid foyln in platz zu ziehen. Higher fruit, heavy on limb, rotting in place, attracting. Ginkgosaft hingrich, suda insects batzolt in steigen zu bagern. Cider hungry binging insects paid up front to covet. Zamen Arber Stadt Grenitz zu Lantern lit Gerentnisch Kreis Fruchtbar mit Geduld. Seeds across state lines to lantern lit crop circles, fertile with patience. Mm. And that's what I've done so far. I had a word and I lost it. Um, for insect. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Because that was a word that you didn't translate. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, and now it's gone. Um, past pug. Um, Oh, I keep almost having. That's so beautiful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you did that. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's what I have for you. That's it's all such I. such beautiful. That's all I have. Imagery and heavy mm-hmm. limbs. <laughs> and. Um, sidewalk ants thank you yeah <laughs> it's a bummer that the camera turned off because I would have loved then you to get my red see, nose. <laughs> see you <laughs> yeah oh. but I'm glad you could hear it and it was perfect I'm glad that I never shared it mm, with you <laughs> yeah what a man you are <laughs> thank you and to you I guess we'll just say goodbye and thank you. Deep poof. Yeah, thank yeah. you for doing this. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Mm-hmm. This is a beautiful thing. Yeah, it was a really good conversation. I really appreciated it. We're at just just under an hour and a half. Wow, wait. <laughs> yeah. I could go for hours more. <laughs> yeah. It'll be part two and three and four. Yeah. Well. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>